Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Chiluminati Podcast, episode 64. As always, I'm one of your hosts, Mike Martin, joined by my other two hosts, Alex Fasciani and Jesse Cox. Hello, Patreon. Boys. What's up? Head to it. Go wow, get it. We We're get supported it. by Patreon. I'm trying to just get it out of the way. I didn't even get to say hi. Hi. Hello, Jesse. Patreon is how we're supported. Head there. Get some free stuff. Wow. If you want to listen to more of this at the end of the show, 15 more minutes to an hour sometimes of more Chiluminati Pod at patreon.com. This slash is Chiluminati Pod. You love to see shameless. it. Shameless. <laughs> shameless. That's a show on uh, oh. <laughs> Showtime uh, with William H. Macy that's based on a show f- from. BBC? I don't know. Is it like skins well, a for BBC adults? BBC show called, called Shameless? I don't think that's, that's... an old show. I don't think that's even in like the British language. Shameless? That's, I'm, <laughs> I don't think that's a word. <laughs> you don't think the British have no shame? No. They are, they I guess that's... <laughs> I, think, I think they are all shame. And if anything, the British have... The, the word for shamelessness is like... Borgadiggity. Borgadiggity. <laughs> that's good. All right. <laughs> I was incredibly English. I, I absolutely. Uh, oh, you got the ball good, it, eh? Yep, that's it. They, that's got, what, they got the ball good, it, I think I remember they? somebody saying that to me last time I was there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's wow. ball good, it, it, it. The there, Alex. <laughs> yep. No, nope, it's the ball good, it, it, it. You got to say it all. Oh, my God. It's like aluminium. Oh, my God. <laughs> the Americans, it's your aluminum. Alum- oh, aluminium uh, is the one that I like have to take a stand on because <laughs> is it spelled like that? No, right? I believe it is actually. Let me Aluminium? find out. Aluminium? No. I mean, it might be maybe <laughs> can technically allowed to be spelled both ways. Alu- no, aluminum. aluminum. Yeah, it's aluminum. <laughs> aluminum. So wait, I don't understand. But no, but look, okay, look. search aluminum and then it goes down here. Aluminium. Alumin and then aluminum in American and Canadian. So it's both are correct. That's well, funky. it's just like color. Color. But they don't say and like color. color. A useless no, or you. yogurt and yoghurt. Yoghurt? Nobody says yoghurt. Uh, ha, 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 there's an H, my friend. Yoghurt. You, that's why that's, and that's, my friend, is why you're a bug diggity Shog, shallots. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> this is a show about mysteries. This is a show about creepies. That is a mystery. Yeah. It, I mean, it is, Alex, you are correct. And you apparently have brought us a fresh mystery guys right off yes. the mystery grill serving guys, side of yes, fried I did. conspiracies you are you are so correct uh Wait, and is I, this an alex episode it is. It is. surprise we got two in a it row is. surprise and the thing that's crazy about this alex episode is that it's much less it's much more it's like almost it could be a mathis episode wow first you know of what all, i mean what what's that mean this could be a Mathis episode because just because of the subject matter and like what going what uh, what happened so it's here. All, it's all bullshit. No, no. But that's why this is so crazy. That's why this is like the perfect fusion. This this is a this is a very interesting <laughs> thing. Okay, because I like when Mathis just shakes his head at me like you non-believer. Look, look, you'll never man. understand. Oh God, don't don't. You're just I'm on a hair trigger, man. Don't look, don't do it. Let me let me justify myself. Okay. Oh, you sound like me every more and more no, every for, sentence. For real. I'm going to look into the mirror naked and justify myself to you guys right now. Whoa. Yeah. After the Roswell episode. Right now? Yeah, right now. I'm naked right now. Uh, I After the Roswell episode, inside, I'm naked. Under my clothes, I'm naked. <laughs> after the Roswell episode, I found myself in an annoying position, right? Because on the one hand, like super interesting, super into aliens again, like uh all this disclosure stuff in the news has been like spooking me out a little bit like speaking of I the pentagon still feel has formed like I, a brand new task force to investigate you yeah, i still i still feel like it's like never gonna happen like no, in they're my gonna heart string of us along forever <laughs> yeah i still feel like it's never gonna happen in my heart of hearts but there's been a few times where i've been like eyeball emojis about it <laughs> yeah. like is it gonna happen uh, but at the same time, like every time i go into any sort of alien story i always get to the same like dead end of like And so they said that and it's like, yeah. And then it's like, but where's the evidence? And it's like, well, it's a cover up. So there's no evidence. So that's the whole problem. Because if you did say there was evidence and there was an alien thing, they would cover it up. You know, like you always run into that problem. You know, and and I don't want to, I'm not, listen, okay. You pulled the trigger just a tiny bit. Can I, the other issue with this fucking topic is people like Tom DeLonge. Listen, I love I know. Tom DeLong for everything he's done. He's done a great. Why are we wait? Why are we making fun of Tom because DeLong? Because the other day, a few episodes ago, you were like, "He's uncovering he's, the truth, yeah, everyone." Because he is. Because because he isn't. He but he's also his heart doing is in the, the right place. His heart yeah. is exactly. But he's also like every other UFO enthusiast, where he doesn't think before he like 
put shit out there. For to comparison, we're YouTubers, we're podcasters, we have a little bit of responsibility to entertain and you know keep things you know certain Lively. a certain way. Tom tweeted out on his or retweeted on his Instagram a video from 2018 that has been so thoroughly debunked many many times. And his caption was, "I don't know. It doesn't look like." Uh, doesn't look like a hoax to me, I think was the caption or something along those lines. And just like, and everybody's like looking at it's like, that's such an old video, Tom. Tom, you're like in charge and have a, a contract with the United States government for this stuff. Right. You are, you're making it worse. You're making the case worse for our, for yourself by doing so this. So what you're saying is, is no, the Jesse. more you become invested <laughs> no. in the idea Stop. of aliens being real, Stop. the more you're willing to accept Stop. nonsense as true. I think about it like theoretical physics where it's Weird. like, I think about it like theoretical <laughs> physics where you can't just say everything. You can't just go in the news and be like, parallel universes are real and and like, here's how they work and all this stuff. You can't say that because you don't know, right? But you think it and you think it could be possible, but you don't just go out saying it because that's how you get ridiculed by your peers. But, and, and, I, I, and, I, and I will yeah. say too, when you the, like all those things, the parallel universe, this stuff, if you ever read past the headline, it's always way more complicated than that. And like, it's not just a simple like mirror universe where we're walking backwards instead. Right. It's like weird science. So please don't send any more emails to my email box saying that we don't understand the bat. I get it. I know yeah. we're not scientists. Yes. You don't understand. I get it. Yeah. S Jesse is Jesse. not a scientist, but he's smart. So he gets no it. No one sends me those emails. I'm just saying. <laughs> <That's 'cause> you <laughs> don't send seem, me those emails. You don't seem like you would be receptive to them. <laughs> 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 uh, okay, but as a result of that sort of like cynicism that I developed, right, I almost fell out of the aliens thing. And though it was my intention to do an alien episode the other week, instead, I ended up doing the Dark Corners episode, which turned out fine, which was great. But like, I wanted to do an alien episode. Uh, and I almost just like let it pass and went back to working on JFK. But... Luckily for all of us, I think I was watching Disney Plus the other day. I was trying to just I was oh, doing my sweet. I was doing my like, you know, you spend 40 minutes just like looking at what's on there type thing. And I found, uh, you know, on Disney Plus, they have a National Geographic uh, thing. And mm -hmm. I found on there this show that was called UFO Europe, the untold stories. And even though it sounds like a bad show, just based on the title, the yeah. very like turns out Nat Geo is like not bad. And the very first case that they showed on that show turned out to be like exactly what I was looking for. So I went like super deep into it right away. And it's great because at first glance, it's just like every other UFO story that you hear. Uh, a guy is alone in the woods. He has like a weird encounter. He wakes up like dazed later, has like a weird memory of what happened, that type of story. But for once, this guy actually did the thing that we always talk about people should do in these instances, which is that he went to the police and reported it as a criminal assault. Okay. So I'm not sure that this is fair to all victims of alien thingies, encounters, mix -ups. alien abductions. It, uh -huh. Well, I mean, there's a scale, a grading scale that goes all the way up to, I believe the fifth uh, encounter of the yeah. fifth kind. So, well, I'm not trying to roast any of those people. And maybe in the end, it was just because this happened in like a sleepy part of Scotland Mm. that everybody had the time to like do something like this. But as a result of this, this guy, a man called Robert Taylor, uh, by the way, uh, but because he actually took the time to go to the police, uh, this event, the Deckmont woods incident or the Robert Taylor incident, uh, as this event eventually became to be called, is the is one of the only, if not the only, UFO sighting ever investigated forensically by the actual police as a criminal assault. Uh, and luckily for us, you know, and against that sort of cynicism, all of those records are publicly available. Interviews, photo evidence, expert testimonies, examinations of evidence, physical evidence still exists. So this is a very unique case when it comes to alien encounters, right? Very, very rarely do you have a still have or physical evidence. And the, usually the only kind of physical evidence that any abduction scenario anybody can find is sometimes like a little bit of burnt grass or some yeah. pressed down areas. And that's basically as far as evidence you, from, from these encounters for the most part get. And that's so funny because they go through so much 
like effort to make clear that the grass yeah. was never scorched during this incident, like right. over and over again, because people keep mentioning it in like mm-hmm. the news stories about the event because it's such a trope yep. of these events. Exactly. Uh, uh, and also real quick before we start, the, the account of events is based not only on the Disney Plus episode, uh, which again, that show is called uh, UFO Europe, the untold stories, if you want to watch it. Go check uh, it out. But also a book on this subject, which I read uh, by one of the researchers from the video who is called Malcolm Robinson, uh, which I used because it contains the full transcripts of all the different interviews uh, with Taylor, with the cops, uh, all the different people that they talked to. Um, and it also has some very good accounts by Robinson, who was there within a day of it happening, and a couple other UFO guys who are a, you know, a little bit more credentialed than most, <laughs> uh, who also ran a bunch of independent in- investigations. And it's cool because a lot of those things that those UFO investigators did synced up perfectly with like the stuff that the cops and forensic investigators said. So it's really some actually interesting stuff. And that's another reason why I think this case is so exciting is because it's so fact checkable, right? So let's get into the case. Here's what happened. Uh, It was a little bit after 10 a.m. on November 9th, 1979, when Robert Taylor, a foreman forester for the Livingston Scotland Development uh, Development Corporation in Scotland, uh, was uh, he was headed towards the Deckmont Woods in a pickup truck along with Laura, his family Irish red setter. Uh, And that's basically, um, you know. Just like all of this stuff, like I said, this is a timeline that's verified from his testimony synced up with everybody else involved. So this is this is all verifiable. He was 61 years old. He was known as a good dude uh, with a good reputation around town. This guy is like a straight shooter. He was a veteran. He was actually at Dunkirk. He's like decorated. He has no history of any other paranormal phenomenon or any major medical issues. Later in his life, he had some kidney stuff, uh, but he lived a normal length life, passed away in 2007. Um, but... Uh, the Livingston Development Corporation was kind of like the like local forestry service at the time in that area. And uh, it was Bob Taylor's job to go along a bunch of gates on these roads through the woods and just check to see that they were all shut like they were supposed to be and that there weren't any cattle or sheep that like got out and went into the public woods. What right. A thrilling night of work every night. Right. Well, this, up to a gate. this is this is at check 10 a.m. This is at 10 a.m. So this shut. is sun out, sun's out, guns out. Like this right. is morning well, even, time even more boring. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I could be out enjoying my day and I'm shaking gates. Exactly. Uh, but that what what the, that serves to illustrate is that this is a path that he traveled many times before. It's part of his routine. Uh, and as a lifetime forester, he knew the woods, the nature, just everything going on very well. Uh, however, today, as he came around the corner into what he expected would be a big open clearing, he instead found a huge dome-shaped object hovering a little bit above the grassy forest floor. He says that it was completely crazy looking, unlike anything he'd ever seen, and for a good long while, he just stood there staring at it, soaking in all the details while his dog, Laura, was literally just like barking her ass off next to him. Um, He says the thing was dark gray all over, and it had a rough sort of like brushed metal texture to it, if you can imagine that. Okay. Um, And he could see absolutely no sign of any sort of seam or gap anywhere in its construction, almost like the whole thing was one piece, even though that seems like it's impossible. Which is... Uh, extremely common for UFO exactly. descriptions. If you go back to the Roswell, the same description was for used for their UFOs. It was completely seamless and smooth. Exactly. Uh, so he also described like an old, old school, like UFO style flange around the circumference of the dome, uh, mm-hmm. which is like not quite a saucer. It's not quite a saucer shaped object, but if you can imagine like a ball with a skirt around it, that's kind of what I mean by a flange. And actually I have, uh, I have a link for you. You guys can see, the actual uh, craft. I'll send it along in just a second for you guys. Um, I do know of this case, but it's been a while since I have uh, visited it. So I'm excited to. So it's like a dome ball thing. It It has the flange around it and around the flange at regular interval at at regular intervals is something that he called propellers. But when he described them visually, it was much more like little spikes coming off the top. So you can kind of just imagine this like half ball with a skirt on with these little spikes going around on the skirt, pointing up off the, off the skirt. Um, and also on the flange where, above the dome. The picture? Sorry. 
I'll, I'll send it to you in just a second. Oh, okay, gotcha. Uh, above the flange on the dome, he said he also saw some dark spaces that he felt were windows, uh, though he wasn't exactly sure because they didn't seem to be made of anything that like glass, and he couldn't really see through them, but he just, from the way it looked, he felt like, oh, there's like a viewing port there. Um, and here's where it gets weird, because he says at this at this point, parts of the craft as he was watching it started to like shift and change. And he could like partially see through parts of the craft at some points to the trees behind it. Uh, like, you know, almost like it's getting like a little bit less tangible. And then it shifted back immediately after a few seconds to like fully solid. And then right after that happened, two big giant, spiny like sea urchin looking rolling objects that look like mines from the Atlantic Ocean in World War II dropped out uh, six spindles jutting off of each one and uh, just rolled towards him at high speed. They like dropped out of the bottom and rolled towards him at high speed. So I'm going to send you uh, an image of that. It's a like a, a police drawing, simple police drawing of what he said he saw. You guys can like sort of give him. You can weigh in if, you, if you they want. look like COVID viruses and being yeah. attacked. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, the UFO uh, itself, like I mean, other than that being kind of a just a very simple drawing, you know, that's another shape like that's they regularly have, they, seen. They have bows, like the skirt has bows. Yeah, yeah, I, it's adorable. Like he said, they were propellers uh, originally, but then like there's like three or four interviews with him in this book, and he kind of like slowly sort of went back towards them being more like spikes. But I think because he was saying propellers, I think this drawing, uh, you know, has the propellers for that reason. And mm -hmm. I, I will tell you guys, uh, that are listening to this, that these images are from, uh, the book. So I don't know about the rights to them. So I definitely will not be posting an unlisted imager link to our, um, yep. subreddit after this. I definitely will not be doing that so that you can't head there and check it out. Uh, after this so don't even try uh so then he recalled that these uh mine things were the exact same gray color as the larger craft and as they rolled towards him on their six spiny legs he said they repeatedly made like a sucking sound or a plopping sound or possibly a slurping sound <laughs> and that's, uh, that's just on the grass <laughs> yeah. it's just making its way towards you it's like rolling towards him and like, <laughs> like super weird. Uh, pretty immediately though, they moved very fast. They got on either side of him, and then was he, he in this said, "Truck still? I'm sorry." Or is he? Asked, no, is no. He's he he parked his truck and he walked into this. He's clearing. doing his walk. Okay. When he does the when he checks the gates, he's like walking down a yep. path in the okay. In the forest. Gotcha. Um, pretty immediately though, they got up on either side of him. He said one spike from each of the mine balls shot out and grabbed each side of his trousers just below the pockets. And then strongly yanked him towards the dome ship. And simultaneously, at this point, he describes noticing an acrid smell in the air, which he describes as smelling like burnt brake linings. Uh, he says he can taste this in the back of his mouth and throat. And he also hears a loud uh, whooshing sound uh, that sounds like you took a cane and, quote from him, swished it through the air. Like that, like, whoo. You know, that like whooshing sound of like swinging yeah. a pole arm around. Okay, <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Uh, now, obviously, this would be a lot for anyone to take this in. This is, man, these aliens need to come up with a better way to abduct people. This, this is, feels yeah, I don't know extra. what it's like it the seems prisoners. like a, like a ludicrous system. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> this is okay. Like, this is some I'm extra. I'm glad you're on the same page with me, Matthew. This seems like a lot. It looks like <laughs> a ball with Q-tips sticking out. Like it's some weird is that a human? Is that a human? Uh, I think it is. Deploy I'm hearing, the abductor balls. <laughs> Send the coronaviruses. What's, what's that? What's that? Uh, Danny Elfman song at the beginning of uh, Pee Wee, where it's like oh, uh, the whole thing plays, and it's like the Rube Goldberg <laughs> machine. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> that's, how I, that's how I imagine. <laughs> Every alien abduction is they pull one lever and like a ball <laughs> rolls <laughs> and they're like, get them. Uh, but in, at the same time, it's so weird to see the similarities between them and yet the bizarre, wild differences into how they get abducted. It always weirds me out how specific are, it is. Sometimes they're like paralyzed and they're kind of elevated out a window or they're taken from their car and kind of dragged up like your typical what you would see in a movie. Right. Uh, this I've never just like it's like aliens first abduction. 
It's yeah, like, 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 I don't. I, I hear that backwater planet Earth got them uh, humans you could abduct. Let's go practice. Let's see if these work. It's almost like it's almost like he caught them with their pants down. And they were like, oh, fuck, <laughs> throw these fucking balls at him. Yeah, shit, shit. Our tractor beam's not powered up. All right. Yeah. Sorry. Continue. No, I that's like that's like what it feels like. So obviously this would be a lot for anybody to take in, you know, what he's going through at this point. So it's anyone's guess whether this was the nerves that he was feeling or whatever it was that was causing the smell, maybe or maybe for Mathis, some invisible alien kidnapping tech. I don't know. Uh, but it is at this point that <laughs> I think Robert the Taylor smell is actually the aliens. I think that's the implication is that they yeah. actually just smell. Yeah. Uh, but it's at this point that Robert Taylor, like many alien assaultees before him, lost consciousness and fell to the ground. Right. Uh, and he woke up uh, uh, and he was alone again with his dog in the same clearing. 20 minutes or so had passed. And when he moved to get up, he found that not only did he have a raging headache, but he also felt sick, like he had a fever. He had a burning sensation uh, in his chin and he was so thirsty and dry throated and like lock jawed that he literally couldn't speak, not just from like not being able to, but also like his mouth felt paralyzed to the point that he couldn't even make sound to use his two way radio while he was out there. Okay. Uh, and I'll send you guys a uh, little clip of the, not a clip, but an image of the scene just to give you an idea of how it looked from above. Uh, really quick. Um, he also had very limited ability to use his legs at this point. Uh, similarly, they were kind of like paralyzed feeling for him. So he ended up actually crawling to his truck, uh, and getting in, like climbing in and on the road home, he discovered that he was so out of it that he ended up actually like driving his car into a ditch and having to leave it there. And then he cut through like a field to get home and got back to his house uh, maybe like an hour after he first saw the ship at 1115. So he saw the ship a little after 10 and this all happened. He was passed out maybe for 20 minutes or so, woke up, got all the way back home in about an hour's time altogether. Uh, so when he's at home, his wife is at home and nowhere did I see his wife's name mentioned? I don't know if it's because she didn't want to be mentioned, but I'm just yep. referring to her as his wife because that's literally how everybody re uh, refers to her. <laughs> um, he tries to croak out his story about a strange spaceship encounter the moment he gets home. Uh, but his wife, who saw his muddy clothes and thought he got the shit kicked out of him and was just like completely out of it, uh, called his boss at Livingston Development Corp, a guy named Drummond, uh, and their local physician, who's a guy named Dr. Gordon Adams, and they both, like I said, small town, they just both headed right over to his house. Uh, so from a preliminary cursory examination, Dr. Adams saw no sign of head injury or neurological disorder apparent at the time. Normal blood pressure. Uh, noticed there was a slight graze under his chin that's unexplained. Uh, subtle marks on his legs where he said he was grabbed uh, through his trousers. Uh, and slight sh uh, signs of shock. Uh, you know, like his body was in shock a little bit, uh, but he still uh, took Robert and his wife over to the Bangor Hospital, which is nearby, uh, and we'll talk about a few more times in the story. Uh, so remember that it exists. Uh, but it sent him there for a full checkup. And while he was at the hospital, uh, Mr. Drummond, his boss, went back over to the scene with a couple of workers to see if they could find anything uh, that made Taylor's story make sense. So after about like two hours of waiting around for the doctor and stressing out because he was supposed to be taking his wife and kids out uh, for a family holiday that weekend, uh, Robert Taylor ends up discharging himself from the hospital, signing himself out and heading oh, back home to get ready. Uh, and he ran into his boss at home at his house who said he couldn't find anything. Hold on. Let me put Wallace back on the bed really quick. He's adorable, though. That, that Wallace. He just stares well, patiently at the bed waiting for his elevator ride. He's just trying to figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so. So that frustrated Taylor because he really wanted to get on his vacation because he really like just to be clear, like Taylor is like a guy who's completely unflappable. He never divert like his story checked out like the cops like interviewed him like three or four times. He never changed the details of his story. The guy was famous for sort of having a sort of nonchalant sort of attitude about it. He never really sought any sort of fame or money for it. And he just wanted to sort of get a, 
like get a, get on with his life. Like people even like would make fun of him. So he'd like downplay it. So that's where his head is at. Uh, but even in that headspace, he was so frustrated that his boss didn't find anything down there because he remembered all these weird little marks that were in the grass when he was out there that he saw. Uh, so they actually both headed right back out there. So now we're, you know, a f- just a few hours after this went down. Right. Uh, he headed back out there a second time. The police had already been notified, uh, but they hadn't arrived yet. And lo and behold, on closer inspection, sure enough, there were a bunch of holes and track like marks making a distinct pattern in the ground because it turned out they hadn't been looking in the exact right place when Drummond had come out there before. Uh, and I just gave you guys another little image you guys can look at that sh- sort of shows the marks and where they were. Whoa. Okay. This is an in depth image. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. So here's a quote. Can you walk us through this? Yeah, so here's a quote uh, from Mr. Drummond about the holes, okay? In the center were something like caterpillar tracks, and that's like a, you know, like a tractor. Uh, in, the, in the center were something like caterpillar tracks surrounded by deep triangular marks the size of a horse's hoof. There is no doubt in my mind that these marks were made by a perfectly solid, heavier-than-air object. They had been made by some machine which had come vertically downward. I don't believe in anything from outer space. The only conclusion that I can come to is that it must have been a man-made object, some sort of secret machine belonging to one of the government departments. Okay. So the the two sets of tracks, and you can see this in the image, which I definitely will not secretly be uploading to our Patreon, uh, is like tractor things that are evenly spaced that look like maybe they're a part of a machine, like two lines of inline tractor tracks. And then all around that are like little... And that the detractor tracks seem like maybe they were made by the ship and the little the little like hoofy things are a lot more erratic and look like maybe they were made by the schlorpy balls. Yeah, the sh- that, that's yeah. Um, but the tracks so like said, are, are they're saying are oh, like where the ship maybe landed. The tra- it, it, yeah. It's not clear because so there was a whole thing about this drawing that he did and it's not this drawing. There's a much more detailed one that I think is a little bit less accurate because it kind of came after but that one has four legs on the craft uh but after like checking everybody's notes back and forth the artist was like you know what i don't think there actually were legs because i don't see him talking about that anywhere i think i just like added them so i want to like rescind this image i think i added the legs uh the official story from taylor and from everybody else was that this craft was actually floating but there's yep. no explanation like the idea is that maybe the bigger tracks came from the ship and that the little erratic tracks around it kind of you know they look like they were made by something moving around um yeah uh and like i said it was at this point that the livingston police also got involved and within hours of the event taking place uh they had drummond cordon off the area so people couldn't walk their dogs through it or whatever uh and they interviewed a bunch of people including taylor took a bunch of photographs of the very real marks in the grass which were actually there that they even brought in an artist like i said to sketch it uh and it was also sort of fortunate that it was november Uh, Because even though this took a couple days to look into uh, and a lot of people came by to check it out, uh, you know, as close as they could get, because there was a layer of snow that kind of came down over everything, it sort of just like locked everything in so they could come and like look at it and like take the snow off and just like see it almost like preserved underneath. Um, So while Bob was gone on vacation for a day or two, uh, you know, like I said, he went on holiday uh, his daughter, Anne stayed behind, um, in town and the police came by to visit her. That's where they got his clothes from his whole outfit. Uh, they were all sent away to Edinburgh for processing and, uh, they were inspected on site w- along with the police by a specialist, a civilian scientist called Lester Nib. And, uh, here's what they found. The pants were actually standard issue police trousers, which seems weird but actually is not that uncommon for like a laborer to wear something like that. You just go Mm -hmm. down to the store and you just pick up like the police, the police pants. You know what I mean? They don't have like a badge on them. They're just like the type that police wear. Uh, Not uncommon for people to be wearing at that time, but it's important because police pants are like pretty well tailored. They're like tough pants, right? They're made for wear and tear. Uh, He left home in a pair of clean undamaged pants, came home with them caked in mud and torn on both thighs. 
Uh, they were also dusted with some kind of white powdery substance, but that was later found uh, to just be maize starch, which was in the grocery bag that his daughter put it in to send to the cops. So that was like a mystery that they like almost had that they like solved. Uh, but the tears themselves are very interesting because they were torn. And this is a tear that tore through. They cut his legs almost like I don't think there was blood drawn, but they were like big scratches on both sides through his <laughs> pants and through his long johns. Uh, so the tears were very interesting because they were torn in a way that would require fairly considerable force. Uh, and here's a quote uh, about them from the book uh, to give you a better idea on both sides. The damage is an area about 26 centimeters from the waistline on the outer thigh. Uh, when viewing the trousers, the damage on the left leg was seen to be a vertical tear. That's five centimeters long at the bottom of which is a horizontal tear going two and a half centimeters to the right, okay? Leading vertically upward from the right-hand side is a six and three-fourths centimeter tear of which the first two and a half centimeters is straight and clearly, th- uh, clearly torn. This is opposed to the rest of the line, which is in a rougher state, okay? So you can kind of picture, picture that. And on the right-hand side, the damage consists of a 2.61 centimeter angled tear, 25 degrees upward from a left-hand center point. About midway along this is another small tear vertically upwards. So I have the pants here, and they actually whip these I'm so glad. I'm so glad you do. They actually whipped these out in the video, too. Hell yeah, whip those pants out. Um, Yep, there it is. Mm. And so what is... So these things that happened... The implication here is what exactly? The little spiny balls pierced the legs, right? That's what he says. Uh, And and to Nib, the guy who investigated it, he said that this seemed consistent with the story, and he theorized that the trousers had been gripped by something that had a width of 2.5 centimeters uh, and then lifted, which would explain the horizontal tear and the two vertical tears. So the the horizontal, like like grab and tear, and then then you lift, and it like rips, right? Uh, and so the clean rip comes from the 2.5 centimeter long grip. That's like a clean like rip. And then the, the rippy rip, the like shredded rip is from like gravity. You know what I mean? And the force of him, okay. him, him being yep. pulled up. Right. Uh, it- and possibly even dragged along, which is what Taylor said happened to him in the stories that he got like kind of pulled towards the dome. I'm just, uh, I'm still baffled by this being their tactic. I know. I know it's super weird, Uh, but you know, they can have a completely different body size and shape to us. He also says the tear, uh, the tears, the tears definitely could not have been made by a single pointed object, like a nail or something that he might've like, if you could imagine him like scrambling around in the ground and like tearing, getting it caught on something like that. Like that's not what happened here. Uh, It it seems like it was made uh, by a wide object uh and uh uh, his undergarments which were long johns since it was november so it went all the way down his legs are consistent with it so it wasn't like something that he did after the fact and just did to his pants right you can't just be like it just the pants tore on a rock from the ground because the second layer was also pierced right now obviously this doesn't verify the alien element of the story but it does give legitimacy to the claim of him being physically assaulted by some sort of machine which no matter how you explain it is like a weird thing that happened. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing uh, from the police uh, report, but also according to both police and independent investigators, which means they, they were both reporting the same information. The marks in the grass made by the dome ship were also very real. These like tractor ones and consisted of quote, Two parallel lines of rectangular depressions, 2.35 meters apart and 2.66 meters long. Both tracks were composed of seven or eight of those depressions. It was impossible to know exactly how many as in removing the snow, they accidentally damaged one or two of them. Uh, Each having the length of about 40 centimeters uh, long, 10 centimeters high and they're 18 centimeters apart from each other. So like 18 centimeters, an, a mark, 18 centimeters, a mark, 18 centimeters, a mark. Gotcha. Uh, and the appearance could be likened to a depression made in soft, grassy soil by a large piece of flat metal. The ground had not been pierced by the weight, although it had been severely depressed, and the soil dipped about one centimeter in the more prominent of the mark. So as heavy as this was, it wasn't like something that like, 
bam. Like it wasn't like something that like smacked the ground and dug in. It was much more like something that was laid there that just only slightly depressed uh, in terms of the tractor looking marks on the ground. Um, they also noted that while some of these markings could maybe have been made by known digging or forestry equipment, there was nothing leading to the marks or away from the marks, making the idea that they were made by something that was driven there very unlikely. You know what I mean? Like, yes, like if you look at it, maybe it's consistent with some sort of vehicle, but how did the vehicle get there? You know what I mean? Like there's no sign that it arrived there from any direction. Uh, so again, not saying it was definitely aliens, but just based on the police evidence, it's pretty clear that something was there. And there's even some evidence for the rolling sea mine shapes, uh, though the, quote, the indentations left by the supposed spikes on the spheres are extremely baffling. A number of these could be plainly seen between the two tracks in line round the rear and sides and leading up to where the percipient allegedly came into contact with the spheres. And you can see this all in that uh, diagram that will definitely not be available on pa- uh, um, the subreddit. Yeah. Uh, Reddit.com. <laughs> uh, in line and round rear sides leading up to where the percipient allegedly came into contact with the spheres. Not all were uniform depth and shape. A couple of strange marks were nearly twice the size of the rest. Uh, but in general, however, they were all the same. A mark like that of a hoof cutting into the grass and soil in a horseshoe shape with a slope down towards the back of the mark. In some cases, these marks were as deep as seven to nine centimeters as if something had slit the soil under the hemisphere of the horseshoes as far back as six centimeters. So I'll give you guys a picture of that so you can try and describe that to everybody because that's kind of a hard thing to understand. But this is a pretty good sketch. You can kind of like see what the deal is here. It just looks like a, you, like a like a like the heel part of a footprint. Yeah, but you see how at the in the front there, like it kind of digs into the ground. Yeah, like like, it you kinda, were, like if you were taking a step, you kind of kick back really hard. Almost like you dig into the yeah, ground you dug, to you like dig pump. into the ground with your heels. What it looks yeah. like, yeah. Except you're traveling. Except the motion is the other way. Right. Yeah. It's if if the heel of your foot mark was like you going forward from you running really fast. Yeah. Except forward. Like yeah. it'd be like you running with the shoes on backwards forward. It's and your shoes would have to be like, it's very bizarre. Yeah, it's a pretty it's a pretty bizarre little mark, uh, and they were all over the place, like all over the place. Uh, also, weirdly enough, according to some investigators, uh, Taylor and his dog Laura were both said to have lost their appetites completely for twenty four hours, five days after the events took place. Uh, seems kind of weird and circumstantial. But I only mention it because later it will resonate with some evidence that I bring up later. And it did. It was recorded. So I am mentioning it now. Um, But yeah, that's basically the long and the short of what we know to be true about the event. Uh, Was it the cold hard facts? Yeah, though Robinson, <clears throat> along with two other prominent UFO investigators who I was talking about earlier, Andrew Collins and Martin Keatman, who are from the UFO Investigators Network and the British UFO Research Association, uh, they did a bunch of legwork regarding other strange occurrences in the area that week, uh, along with some theories of what could have happened here. So let's get started. I'm going to paint a picture of what else was going around Livington, Scotland. Normally, I wouldn't do this where we like just look at other things that are like nearby, but the amount of coincidences here is like insane. Okay. So I just thought I'd bring it up because as, little, as I was reading flap. this, as I was reading this, I was like, what the fuck? It's not even like a flap. It's like, it could be the same ship yeah, or maybe. whatever. Mm-hmm. One day earlier on November 8th, a miss Sarah Johnson, age 43 reported three motionless lights in the sky. Uh, around 5 30 PM in a straight line with a configuration white, red, white, which she saw from her car while driving home from work. And then it disappeared behind some buildings. So that's the first thing. 5 30 PM the night before, uh, very nearby same night, several anonymous boys were reported by their teachers as having seen a strange object descend into the forest near deer Hill, which is very near to where Taylor had his encounter the following morning, like walking distance near. And then later that same night at around 8 PM, Mr. A Ferguson of Edinburgh saw a bright strip of light quote, which he said was shaped like a ruler and was headed directly to Deckmont woods, which wasn't, close to where taylor was 
It was literally those woods that it was headed mm-hmm. towards. So that's why I think it's significant. And this was corroborated huh. even further by Miss, Mrs. E. Scott, who was waiting at a bus stop nearby and also saw a long round object with bright lights headed towards the Deckmont Law, a.k.a. the Deckmont Woods. Tic Tac shape. So that's that's a event all that would happen within two to three hours of each other that all see alien spacecraft all in the same like couple mile area. Like we're talking like more close than you would expect close enough that you would feel like maybe they're related. Uh, but that's not even all of it because the next morning, the morning of at 8 a.m., two hours before it happened, a guy called Graham Kennedy was headed down towards Bathgate. And as he passed Bangor Hospital, the hospital that was close enough to what happened, that that's where he went to be inv- to, to be uh, examined. Uh, this guy, Graham, saw a bright light to the left of his car attached to an object a few meters above the ground that was headed straight towards him so quickly that he almost crashed his car. This event was corroborated by at least one other driver and a cyclist who also saw the same light as well as by someone called Ann McGregor, who was a nurse at the hospital who was getting off the bus near her work. And as she was walking, she heard a hissing sound, looked to see what it was and saw a bright light descending toward Deckmont Woods all within an hour or two of this event happening. Yup. Now at 10 a.m., almost at the exact same time that Taylor was being dragged around by this weird machine, uh, somebody called Violet Connor and her sister Lillian Black were driving from Bathgate to Armdale, and they saw a white cigar-shaped light hanging motionless in the northeastern skies for five minutes before losing sight of it behind the building. So that's at the same time that that other thing was going down. And later that same night, the 9th, at 6 p.m., uh, Josephine Quigley and four of her friends, all about 30 years old, saw a silent rotating ring of lights in the sky much lower than any other uh, than any aircraft would fly for about two minutes before one of them got freaked out and decided they wanted to pick up their kids from school. Uh, two hours later. Can I? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'll, all right. I'll, I'll just. Uh, do we do we know when these were actually reported in? These are all police reports that were that were. Hap- that happened uh, in time. Like it wasn't like the report came out and then a bunch of people were like, no, I saw this. These are all police reports prior that happened. Event. What's hmm. that prior to the event. Then they were all reported prior to his, his like, uh, like for example, this guy almost crashed his car and then he pulled over and then he called the cops and the other two people who saw it also called the cops. Gotcha. Like that cool. type. So of it thing. is. Yeah. It's all happening real time. The okay. only one that the only one that was reported after the fact Uh, was the three anonymous boys. And that's because the way that it happened was the guys were at a place investigating some stuff. And these teachers walked up and they were like, yo, our kids saw some stuff and we sent them to the police and they reported it. And it was crazy. That was from the day. It sounds like two ships so far. It sounds like two distinct ships. One, the rotating lights would fit the, the orb one with the rim on the outside. And then a a classic Tic Tac cigar refrigerator shaped, whatever you want to call it. Ship is also in the area for one reason or another. Exactly. Pretty wild stuff. Um, Two hours later, same night as Taylor's encounter, after the women saw the rotating light uh, and she took her kids home from school, also in Livingston, same town, same night, uh, Stephen and Alan Little, uh, two brothers who are 14 and 17, watch a dome-shaped object floating over a main road 400 meters behind their house at a height of 150 meters, glowing bright white, with a large red light on one side and a large blue light on the other side. And they were simultaneously pulsating at one second intervals for about eight minutes before the white light in the middle turned off and only the side lights kept pulsating for another two minutes. They're testing their airplane camouflage. Yeah. And if you want to go deeper than that, there's a bunch of other events that happen in the months before and after this, but I only included these ones. Yeah, but I only include these ones because these ones are so close to this event and so like physically, geographically close to these to the to this event that they almost seem like they could be related. And it's so such next, a concentration of them that it's crazy. My 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 question is: after the event that uh, Mr. Taylor had, did all this cease? Did everything stop again? Like yeah, the, the, the UFO sighting stop? There's there's other mysterious things that have happened in these woods, but there wasn't. I mean, other than the like sort of explosion that definitely happened after <laughs> he was in the media for all this, 
it you know it's not like a particularly active area compared just, to just, any I, other I part of I only ask because like that's another commonality between a lot of U- big UFO scenarios, abductions, whatever you want to call them. There's like the the flap that happens for a week or two weeks or whatever, leading up to a big event of some sort, an abduction, a crash, and then it all stops. Right. Yeah. And and that's kind of what happened here. And obviously, he honestly like I don't think this guy really like wanted this to be his like main thing people Most talk about people him. don't yeah i like he's definitely not like that type of guy there are some stories that his family was like super into it and like thought it was like crazy and like became like alien kin family <laughs> a little bit but alien like it, not not in a way where their like credibility should be considered you know what i mean of course yeah yeah i see what you're saying uh but yeah so that's basically all the all the stuff that happened those days they don't give a lot in the way of verifiable evidence other than that they are other alien related encounters on the same fucking day within like a yeah. mile or two of the actual location uh which is rare you know what i mean where it's like i saw it i saw it i saw it it was yep. there it was doing this it's right by this there's a criminal investigation at the point where it happened like it's a very thorough investigation as far as an alien uh encounter is concerned uh but there are and while nobody knows exactly what happened or whether it was aliens, there are a few theories to explain what could have happened here. uh, Other than just like it was aliens, which is a hard one to swallow. I'm down for this. I'm down. Let's hear. So the first theory suggests that rather than aliens, Robert Taylor suffered from an epileptic fit and hallucinations that were caused by a rare form of black ball lightning. So ball God, lightning this sounds what? like your swamp gas explanation. Well, bullshit. Well, OK, so 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 ball lightning or ghost lights is a type of electrical light sphere that sometimes is created during thunderstorms and can be anywhere from golf ball sized to three or four feet across or maybe bigger. Sometimes even sometimes they last a second. Sometimes they last a minute, sometimes more. Uh, they've been known to create a hissing sound, smell very bad. They dissipate or explode sometimes. Um, nobody really knows what causes it, but there were some researchers at the Zhejiang University in China that have postulated that it's possibly created when microwaves are trapped inside a plasma bubble. People have seen them inside of skyscrapers. People have seen them inside of airplanes, and uh, th- they are a a meteorological mystery at this point. Uh, though they are known to be the source of many paranormal sightings. Uh, This does seem to gel with a lot of the other sightings in the area, especially the physical evidence here, though, of this case doesn't seem to jive with it too much. Like the idea that like he saw it and then like was affected by it in such a way that he like just freaked out and imagined everything else that happened to him is a unsatisfying explanation uh, well, it doesn't does explain, not, like you said, any of the fucking tracks uh, or any of that kind it of stuff. Doesn't af- it doesn't explain his pants being ripped. It doesn't explain any of that stuff. Uh, but it does explain like the paralysis and all this stuff, you know, like like that type of thing. Like that, that's all kind of cool. Before before we move forward again, then my so he never did like a uh, one of the, like what people out here typically do the hypnotism regress memory. What happened to him? He kind of just like left it as is. He just did like a bunch of interviews with the police, and they're sure. all on the record, and they're all very consistent with each other. And you can read them in their entirety if you'd like. Yeah. Uh, oh, the book the book is on Kindle for three dollars if you want to buy it. Uh, this theory was eventually updated to be about a mirage of the planet Venus, uh, (laughs) because allegedly quote Venus at magnitude negative 3.7 lay at only three degrees altitude on a bearing of 138 degrees, almost precisely in the direction in which Taylor was looking. Um, I don't know what that means. Uh, if you're an astronomer and you want to fact check that head to the Reddit Chiluminati pod, where I will definitely not be sharing you these images and, uh, (laughs) You can you can look into that. Wait, so are you? I definitely not. I definitely dude. will not be doing that. Yeah. Uh but like I said, yeah, this doesn't explain any of these physical evidence. It doesn't explain hallucinatory seizures. It doesn't like that's not like a thing that just happens to people. You know what I mean? That's like somebody with a medical history has that and you would know by now or at least by the end of his life that he was susceptible to these things. Um and uh This theory does also bring up the fact that there was some work done in the area by machines about a month before, uh, though none of the machines that were there actually match the measurements 
necessary to make the tracks that were recorded at the scene. You know what I mean? Like normally that would be enough to explain it, but because we have the precise measurements of everything, you can really like compare the chassis of these machines that were there and they don't match. Um, So that's the first theory. It's kind of a wacky theory. Venus Mirage ball lightning theory, kind of whack. Theory two. This one comes from a couple emails by a dude from the Glasgow University Archive who worked under the supervision of the Scottish Records Office. Uh, And so that means they have access to some stuff that some people might not have access to. So I'm going to read those emails right now. There are two military installations near Livingston. One was a nuclear bunker at Wilkieston near near East Calder, and the other was to the north of Livingston, close to where Bob had his experience. I don't want to sound mysterious or conspiratorial, but I should give you some background. Livingston was one of the new towns and enjoyed development status, which meant it was run by a non-elected board of management. When the government decided to remove its development corporation status and return it to the local authority, this was done by act of parliament. An archivist or records manager was appointed, me, to oversee the preservation of the history of Livingston from its inception to dissolution. I was subject to the Official Secrets Act and the privacy regulations. For instance, many of the records of Livingston Development Corporation will remain closed for a hundred years. That's twice as long as the cabinet papers. I had no say in the closure periods, therefore I must be careful on what I disclose. I can, however, point you in various directions if you wish to investigate further. The MOD facility at Livingston was important enough to have a railway spur installed from the Edinburgh to Glasgow main line directly into the depot. It is also interesting to note that shortly after Bob's incident, British Aerospace announced they would cease research and development into unmanned anti-tank vehicles. See Jane's World Aircraft about this period for similar American devices. I think this is what Bob experienced. The reason I suggested you look at Jane's All World Aircraft for 1978 to 1979 to 80, I can't remember the exact year, is because there is a photograph of an American remote anti-tank helicopter type machine remarkably similar to what Bob described, which would deposit mines close to enemy tanks and then retire to a safe distance. The Americans abandoned it because it kept crashing on highways, much to the alarm of the motorists and no doubt the military. If this is what Bob saw, and of course there is no direct evidence that it was, It would have been controlled from some distance away and flown into and out of the site. A contemporary remark by Malcolm Drummond, Bob's boss who went back to the site with him, is worthy of quote. But there were no tracks going to and from the site, which is surrounded by trees. What made them must have weighted more than a ton, possibly two ton. I can't explain what made these marks, but it must have come straight down and gone straight back up again. The first general manager of Livingston Development Corporation, Brigadier Purchase, had a great love of having each stage of development photographed and particularly from the air. Such photographs exist of the MOD site. So this is another convincing theory. This possibly could be a lead, right? But it has no physical evidence. I haven't been able to find this book. I haven't been able to find this image of this craft that looks similar to what he was describing but the way that he described it seems like it could be the same thing uh doesn't explain how he was grabbed or pulled or the smell or him falling unconscious but it's interesting so that's yeah that's bizarre yeah so that's theory two that's the mine slash anti-tank vehicle theory theory three uh is a similar theory to the ball lightning theory except it has to do with earth lights which are also bizarre balls of mysterious light that are kind of pseudoscience-y, but that allegedly come from tectonic movements of the Earth's plates rather than from weather. Here is a quote from astronomer John Dykeslag about what uh, he thinks happened. <clears throat> the moment Bob started approaching the object, he entered a highly charged electromagnetic field, the like of which might have had effects regarding the stimulation of his brain, the physical cor- the visual cortex, temporal lobe, retina, etc., while the object itself was composed out of high electrical charge plasma. Suddenly, two separate objects emerged and rushed in his direction due to a process called induction, which is similar regarding the operation of a spark plug in petrol engines where a strong induction current jumps arcs between two conductors, creating a spark. Uh, These high voltage currents are known to arc distances up to 20 meters. Okay. Bob also noticed sucking or plopping noises, which formed an indication of a process called geosound, which is produced by the combined effects, mechanical strain across rock masses and a strong electromagnetic field induced by piezoelectric processes. 
The moment these highly electrically charged objects attach themselves to his legs, whereby penetrating and cutting the non-conductive material of his trousers and long johns making skin contact. Taylor's body worked as a conductor and he received a high level charge of electric energy voltage, which was emitted and exchanged between both objects. His nervous system nearly collapsed and it paralyzed his legs. He might have had experienced a sudden muscular spasm produced by the shock. After noticing a strong, acrid smell, ozone, unconsciousness set in, which can occur when a person is hit by a lightning strike or a high voltage current. So I that's mean, that gives a better sort of idea of what like because I in my mind, I was like, how the fuck could a ball of electricity do this? And this yeah. gives a, at least somewhat sensical example of what that could be though it still seems very far-fetched that it would I, just I be prefer that over the very first explanation of ball lightning yeah that's true it also makes me think that maybe that whatever it was were just tasing him with their weird taser con- right contraptions <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah it's not a completely satisfying explanation but there isn't there is something to it uh but finally the fourth theory other than it actually being aliens which like I don't have a theory for you on that because I can't tell you any facts about aliens because there are none. Uh, <clears throat> the last big theory that people talk about in this case has to do with a toxic wild berry known as Atropa belladonna, which belladonna. The, okay. Okay. Our only options for all of this are like, well, it could have been aliens <laughs> or a secret military test project or electricity or a berry a berry did it he was out in the woods and a berry hallucinated him and that's it is this where why are all these stories like well, this because you, you know they, all, they all seem ridiculous and then you listen to the details and you're like wait a minute yeah because the, the reason is because like the only evidence they have are some depressed tracks in the ground and and he was cut and there's and he was cut yeah uh, anyway, look, these berries contain tropane alkaloid, which can induce delirium and hallucinations. They did grow nearby, uh, and the theory postulates that Taylor either ingested these berries not knowing they were dangerous or got some of the juice on his hands somehow, which then absorbed into his skin. Here's a quote uh, from an expert on that. It is not implausible that during his scheduled inspection of the forest, Taylor came across the plant and handled it in some way. Perhaps he was mindful of the plant's harmful qualities and uprooted it, crushing the leaves, roots, and berries in his hands. Moreover, if he was unaware, uh, no, if he was unaware of the plant's toxic nature, he may have naively consumed one or more of the berries before continuing with his check of the wood. Each scenario would introduce atropine into his system, either by oral ingestion or transdermally. Though one would expect a forester to be familiar with dangerous plants as part of the work remit, the sheer rarity of a species may bring about ignorance. Further, when asked if the Forestry Commission have a policy towards the identification of poisonous plants, they responded, We do not need to specifically train our staff to identify them simply because they don't have to eat them as part of their job, which makes sense. Now, normally this would seem a little stupid, but really quick, let me just list the symptoms of belladonna poisoning real quick and you tell me what you think, okay? Okay. Loss of balance, staggering, headache, rash, dry mouth and throat, slurred speech, confusion, Vivid hallucinations, delirium, convulsions, imaginary odors, a sense of suffocation, locked jaw, great thirst, and a loss of appetite. It's pot. I mean, all like he hit almost all of those. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Uh, You know, that's like the thing that's crazy about this. But it leaves open the question, like, what about the aliens? So. Certain accounts of belladonna poisoning do include hallucinations of being surrounded by bizarre creatures. And there was a diagram that I could not actually get from the book because it was being weird uh, and actually will not be on our uh, Reddit post. But it was showing how if you're looking at a dog running towards you and you like warp the image, it could become like a round ball with four okay. spindles on the bottom and the tail being another spindle and, and another being spindle another. being here. And like, it, it like kind of just showed you how your mind could make that look like that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, this theory states that the actual reason why he saw these specific alien creatures uh, has to do with a episode of popular British sci-fi adventure show, Dr. Who, which was called Ooh. city of death. 
and aired a few weeks earlier on September 29th, 1979, and for the following four weeks, every weekend, uh, and includes a specific spacecraft that's extremely similar to the one that Taylor described. I just sent you guys a picture of it. Obviously, oh. there's still some crazy leaps in logic here, but who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Large portions of this story are just too convincing to ignore. And unlike many other cases where eventually you just figure out the real story, this one never fully comes into focus, which is why I love it so much. And that, my friends, is the Robert Taylor incident. Abduction. The only Anthony. case of a UFO ever being investigated as an assault. Pretty that interesting stuff. Yeah, it's a fun story because, like you said, like this indiscernible physical proof that something went down. Yeah, but there was a there was a there was a big heavy object there that made tracks in the grass. It's always possible that they were there before, but it's unlikely. And these hoof prints were there. These other things were there, and and there was one other thing I wanted to read. I want to let me let me see if I can let me see if I can pull that up really quick. Uh, and this is one of the this is one of the events that I like chose not to share. Uh, that was like one of the alien happenings that went down. If you know what I'm talking about. Well, basically, this girl went missing a little bit before this in the same area. She got lost. They looked for her for days and days and they eventually just found her alive, like crouched hidden somewhere very close to where this event happened. And they were like, what happened to you? Like, how did you get here? What you were not supposed to be anywhere near here. And she was like, I was following the sheep. What? What? <laughs> just the sheep. I was following the sheep. And, you know, they have hooves. I don't know. Like, th th that's that's all I got. Like, there's 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 not really that much gotcha. to this. You just got to remember that his job is that he's checking these pathways to make sure that animals don't get out. So, hooved marks, like, you know, could be some kind of thing having to do with animals escaping. But I just don't know. It doesn't seem right to me. It doesn't seem completely explainable to me. It's a, it's a case that I keep thinking about and turning over in my mind, and I can never really get to the bottom of it yeah yeah no it, it makes sense but it's still a fascinating case because you actually have a little evidence to point to both physical and uh the, the tracks in the ground that were recorded by the police officially the case is closed uh but you know those records are still available and the, and the pants still exist yeah uh, appreciate the story, Jesse. That was I'm Jesse. Alex, sorry, I got to turn over. I see Jesse shaking his head, and my brain was like, "Appreciate I the just, story." I had a lot of head shaking. <laughs> yeah, a lot of head it's, shaking. It's, it's hard to comment on a lot of the story because a lot of it is like factual. Here's what we found. Here's what was there. Yep. The only thing that doesn't make sense is then the conclusions drawn because I don't think they have any. So they're like, it could have been this. It could have been that. We those don't know. All, those are all but, just people who have spent a lot of time investigating the area, trying to come to some sort of conclusion. And that's the best they can do, which is like the mm -hmm. thing that's crazy about it. It's like yeah, all the right. all the like equipment theories fall flat because how the fuck did it get there? Like there's another one that's like, you know, those bomb disposal robots that have like the arms. Yeah. Yeah, there's another theory that like it was one of those, but like there's no reason for it to be there in like the middle Unless of Scotland. Like, like I imagine the only thing I think of is like they're testing it. But even but, then, like, why would they fucking do it in this like public path that a guy walks down every day in the middle of Scotland? Yeah, no, yeah, it's weird. It's yeah. all weird. Well, thank you for taking us on this wild psychedelic alien maybe ride, Alex. We yeah, I hope it. that it at least convinces some of you to go do some more reading about Robert Taylor. Please do, and we are gonna go do some more talking about stuff over on the patreon mini so so we're miss it. off uh wait what i said don't miss it don't miss it i thought you said where is it where like, is it where can you find it yet we can also find it at patreon.com slash illuminati pod uh you don't can go it. get all the kinds of extras over there digital posters exclusive mini sods discords behind the scenes stuff and uh that'll keep on growing we hit a new high so thank you all so much for that continuous to push to our last goal hell yeah of getting us to do some ghost hunting once this is all over and we can leave our houses again uh, if you enjoy the podcast, drop us a review. It goes a long way. So wherever you're listening, pop us a review. Let everybody know how you enjoy it. Uh, you can reach out to us over at the Chaluminati Pod subreddit, the Chaluminati Pod Twitter. And then we each have our own personal Twitters. You can find me over at Mathis Games. Alex, what about you? Where can people find you? Find me at Fossiani A on Twitter and also at the Star Wars New Canon Book Club podcast, which me and Jesse and Davis talk about Star Wars a lot. 
passionately and with great emotion. It's almost like that's what the podcast is for. Yeah. Fantastic. Jesse, what about you, brother? Uh, look, I'm on the internet. I'm you mostly are. here. I'm wherever you need me to be. <laughs> you need me? You need you want to you call me? Call me. I'll show up there. I'll do a don't, thing. I don't know. Don't, don't, don't invite that evil into your life. Your mouth can't cash. What is that? What do they say? I'm not going to be using my mouth. Yeah. yeah. Well, then I definitely don't want to call you. And that's it. Bye, I guess. <laughs> anyway, me and my wife were sitting outside indulging on our porch one night, enjoying ourselves. I needed to go to the bathroom, so I stepped back inside, and after a few moments, I hear my wife go, Holy shit, get out here. So I quickly dash back outside, and she's looking up at the sky in awe. I look up too, and there's a perfect line of dozen lights traveling across the sky.